So it says in chapter 46, verse 8, These are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt, Yaakov Uvanov, Jacob and his sons, Bechor Yaakov Reuven. The son of Jacob was Reuven. Uh, she says, why does it say, oh, Seth, extra bonus today. This is our to be too. this is our Seth bonus. Well, it worked out. All right, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. So it says, these are the names of the children of Israel who come to Egypt, Jacob and his sons, the firstborn, before Yaakov, Reuven, the firstborn son of Jacob was Reuven. Uh, she says, <laughs> Why does it say, uh, she says, who are coming in the present tense? Because Al Shema Sha'ah, because of the moment. And don't be surprised that it doesn't say they came. So they're basically, Rashi says, they're telling the story in the present as though it's, 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 as though it's, uh, Current, as though it's an ongoing thing. Yeah, but that's a stylistic aspect of many parts of it. Right. It's uh. It's uh. So. Yeah. But we're not permitted to go down to Egypt uh, after after we left it. Um, we're not permitted to live there, but we're not up to that point yet. Yeah. No, obviously they're talking about the past, but Rashi says this is what they talked about in the past. Yeah. Uh, okay. So now the verse tells us, B'nai Ruvain, the children of Ruvain were, Chanoch, Pa'u, V'chatron, V'charmi. Okay. And now it's always interesting with the names, what sticks out. Because so the sons of Shimon were Yemuel, Yamin, Oad, V'yachim, V'tzochar, V'sha'ul, Ben Aknanit. And so why are they saying the name of Saul one of Shimon's children, why are they calling him the son of the Canaanite woman? It's highly unusual. See, this is the power, I just want to say, of going through each Rashi. How many times when, when we're studying the Torah portion do we just skip over the genealogy and not even pay attention? But here you have a name, Shaul. First of all, the first king of Israel is called Shaul. See, it was an ancient name. And he's called the son of the Canaanite. Who is this? What's going on? So here this Rashi is going to explode. Wait till we see this Rashi. <laughs> You're going to explode. If you haven't seen this Rashi before, it's explosive. By the way, I just want to tell you, um, before we read this Rashi, I said this at the Parsha Shavua uh, discussion we had today, but since you, I don't think either of you were there, it's worth saying again, because uh, maybe uh, Deborah was there, I don't know, uh, but it's a powerful story. I read in Rabbi Salvechik's commentary. Rabbi Salvechik said, it said at the beginning of the parsha that Judah says to Joseph, you said to us, do you have a father? So Rabbi Salvechik said when he was seven in white Russia, he was in Cheder in white Russia, and his Chabad Rebbe, that's what he said, his Chabad Rebbe came over to him in the middle of the class, and he said they just finished Hanukkah. They were settling down for the dark winter. And he said, the kids were not so into it. They were listless. That was his word. And the Rebbe can imagine having such a tremendous teacher like this, teaching the seven-year-old boys. He said they used to have to go home at night with lanterns. And the Rebbe comes over to Rabbi Salavechik, the young the little Joseph Salavechik, probably Yossi or something. And he says to him, what does it mean when Joseph says to his, uh, says to Jacob, says to his brothers, do you have a father? So Rabbi Salavechik said, he was a young boy. He answered, probably means, is your father still alive? So the teacher and Rabbi Salavechik said, it was like he was giving a speech to an unseen audience. He said, what are you talking about? It should, if that was the case, it would have said, is your father still alive? Why does it say, do you have a father? Who doesn't have a father? Everyone is born with a father. So then he turned to the boy who was Rabbi Salavechik, the young Rabbi Salavechik's Chavrusa, a person named Yitzchak, a person named uh, Yitzchak, who was known as the prodigy, the brilliant prodigy of the town. And he said to him, do you know what it means? Do you have a father? 
It means are you connected to your tradition? Do you realize the greatness of your tradition? That's what it means. Are you like a, a flower that knows that it comes from the tree? Or do you think you're on your own? He said, you Yitzhak, this is what Rabbi Salvechik saying, you Yitzhak, you're the one who's so brilliant, but and your father Jacob is barely literally. But do you realize that, do you think you're smarter than him? Or do you recognize that everything you have comes because of the greatness of your tradition? And, and, this is a story Rabbi Salvechik told 60 years later. Now, Rabbi Salvechik does not mention this in this version of the story, but I once read elsewhere, I don't remember where I read it, that Rabbi Salvechik several times in his public speeches referred to his Chabad Cheder Rebbe. And it was, at that time, he was a young man, but many years later, there was a person who uh, was visiting the Soviet Union to try and inspire the Jews. And he came to the same town that Rabbi Salvechik lived in, and he saw there an old Chabad rabbi. And, and he said to him, are you this uh, teacher? And the man went to nothing to do. He was just like, pushed him away and went back in. The, the man who was Rabbi Salvechik's rabbi as a seven-year-old never left. He never left. I don't know what happened to white Russia during the war, World War II. I don't know where what its status was, but he stayed in Russia. <laughs> And he continued to teach. Place for Jews. I mean, Russia was not a good place for Jews, but he continued to teach all these years. So I remember that story. So I had to share with you because it's just the the impact that a teacher can have on a seven year old. And this teacher probably never even realized the impact that he'd have. That we're sitting here today recounting his words, his incredibly novel explanation of do you have a father where you know how many how much struggle and turmoil did this one man go through in life and yet we're able here to be inspired by his words okay so now what does it may mean when it says Shaul the son of the Canaanite woman what does that mean it means as follows Rashi says Ben Dina that Shimon had a son who was actually the offspring of Dina. Dina was the mother. Why is he called the son of the Canaanite? Because she had become, uh, had relations with a Canaanite. When they killed Shlem, So when Shlem was killed, when, when uh, they went to rescue Dina, she refused to go she refused to go until the Shimon promised that he would marry her. Now, of course, means to say, it means son of the Canaanite woman rather than the son of a Canaanite woman. That's what it means. And so therefore, this is Dina. Now, even though... She's not a Canaanite. Right, but she was the one who had relations with the Canaanite. It's a obviously it's a stretch, but that's how the Midrash understands it. And how are they able to marry their sister? So the Maharal of Prague in his commentary, Gore Arye says they did it through prophetic revelation that they knew that she should marry each other. So this is also uh, uh it seems like such a unnecessary. <laughs> explanation but that's the rabbinic explanation of this name shaul the son of the canaanite rather but, than say that shimon had relations with the canaanite that's what they're saying yeah reb jerry yes it's far-fetched that uh, that uh, he married she married her brother uh, uh that 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 any rabbi uh uh, uh any commentary uh, would 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 come up with that kind of a, a preposterous answer. Well, it's the Bereshit Rabbah, chapter eighty eleven. So okay, uh, it's a little bit uh, a little bit uh, unusual explanation, but Rashi thought it was worthy for us to study. So it says, "Ubnei Levi, the sons of Levi were Gershon, Kahas, and Merari." Okay, and the Bnei Yehuda. Er v'onan v'shelo, we know this already. Uperetz v'zarach, Peretz and Zarach came from Tamar and Judah. Vayamas er v'onan v'eretz Canaan, and Er and Onan died in the land of Canaan. Vayu b'nei Peretz, and the children of Peretz were Chetzron and Chamul. And the children of Yisachar, b'nei Yisachar, Toa, Ufuva, V'yov, V'shimron, and the children of Zavun, b'nei Zavun, Sered, V'eon, V'yachwa, El. 
Yes, Rep. So Seth. I just wanted to say that Steinsaltz comments that although it, it was not actually a prohibition to not marry a Canaanite woman, it was a not an absolute prohibition. It was more of a recommendation. And that's well, they didn't have to be contrary to yeah. be to it, it being pretty much usher that with Torah says you shouldn't marry for later, me. later. So that's it. So anything before, but so before it's, it that's convenient when we want to say that they had Ruha Kodesh about like keeping Shabbos and other things that were later and then not accept that this is not later. Well, this is what they say here in the footnote. You're right. It's a very strong question. But the footnote here, quoting Gur Aryeh, who is the Maral of Prague, says, although the patriarchs and the sons of Jacob kept the laws of the Torah, exceptions could be made through prophetic revelation during the era before the Torah was given. It was through prophetic revelation that they knew that they could marry each other. But you're right. It wasn't just a prohibition of marrying each other. It was also the Canaanite. And Abraham had said specifically, do not marry a Canaanite. Right. It seems like it was, I don't know. It seems like well, whether well, it's Dina or that Rosh's interpretation or whether it's, you know, just a Canaanite. Who married? Some of the other, then the other bit is that there. it's to make clear that the others didn't marry Canaanite women. Right, that's also That true. was the other sort of emphasis that was said is that it's just to emphasize that only Shimon right. did. And also you can read it two other things. Like, and Shimon, it was just Shimon one like person. Keep coming back to them. Right. No, 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 but it's saying Shaul, the, had, Shaul was the son of a Canaanite woman. It says it there. The other way to read it also is... If that's... Yeah. Well, I don't know. The son of which Canaanite woman? Well, no, the point is that everybody else was not the son of a Canaanite, only Shaul was. And then there's another point going on here. And this, I want to be very careful how I say this, but the uh, you, there is a whole theory that we have to read uh, all of the um, narratives and all of the Torah uh, through the eyes of the Davidic monarchy. So the whole point was to establish the monarchy of David and through the line of Judah. And so therefore you want to make a point that Shaul, this name Shaul, he's from a Canaanite. Right. He's from the enemy. Extra oh, clear oh, about oh, the oh, dynasty. Oh, That's okay. what this is. That's another thing. That... I mean, it's a shtoch. Okay. Yeah. It's it's a... The Moabites were okay. Well, that's what David had to say. Well, maybe. Better say it right, but the point was maybe you say, okay, I'm a Moabite, but you're a Canaanite. <laughs> so then verse 15 is also uh, going to be interesting. It's a little rated R. Well, I'm not thing, sure if I should even say about, it. Yeah. Before 15, when Aaron Onan, because we learned earlier that Air prohibited his wife from getting pregnant because he, Rashi said he didn't like her body to be disformed. He was right. like a like a, you know, very vain or whatever. Yeah. But then it, it, it talks about the fact that they also didn't have children. Well, obviously, if you, we knew that. But anyway, that's fine um, that we knew that they because he didn't want his wife to have children. But it, it says here that it's important to list these people in family genealogy because they have an imprint on their legacy, on their family history. So this isn't a very positive legacy that, you know, you're trying to recount i don't know why they're so critical given what they did well so i guess you want to you need to specify that the children uh it says the children of judah were heir onan shela and peretz and zarah we need to specify peretz. that peretz comes from judah right. We, right uh yeah i mean you could talk about like why does it need to mention everything i guess you want accurate records i guess so then uh, okay so now verse 15 is a little bit, uh, Rashi here is a little, I don't know if it's appropriate, so I'll try to see how I could talk about it without getting too graphic. Ela b'nei Leah, these are the children of Leah, Asher Yaldala Yaakov, which were born to Jacob. So that's unusual. Why does it say these are children of Leah who are born to Jacob? Bepadan Aram, in Padan Aram, Vez Dina Bito, and Dina his daughter, all the souls of his sons and daughters were 33. So, so okay, so first of all, I uh, want to say what this Rashi says, and then the second Rashi on the verse is something which Rabbi Ben Mintz taught, taught me, and I always love to mention his name when we study in his base measures, basically. So these are the children of Leah and Dina, his daughter. Rashi says, Hazcharim Talab Leah. The sons were 
were given over to Leah, Lanakeva Talabi Yaakov, but Dina was his daughter. So the female is given over to Jacob. Lamedcha to teach you, Isham Mazraat Tchila, that when a woman sows first, Yoledes Zachar, she gives birth to a male. Ish Mazriat Tchila, Yoledes Nekeva, when a man sows first, she gives birth to a female. Now, I don't think this is scientifically accurate, but there are so many things here that reflect a different understanding of how the bodies work that we'll just leave it at that. I don't feel like the need to go in more in this context, but I just wanted you to be aware of that Rashi. Okay, now the next Rashi, I'll never forget Rabbi Ben Min's teaching, a beautiful teaching about it when I first came to OF that he gave the Dvar Torah Parshas Vayigash that year. It was maybe 20 people in the room and it was a masterpiece. And he cited this Rashi, masterpiece, like only he could do. So he said as follows, it says, but when you count them, but when you count all these names here, you'll find there were 32 names. So why does the Torah say there were 33? So who's number 33? 33 is Yocheved. She was born between the walls. Upon their entry into the city. She was born to Levi in Egypt. She was born in Egypt, but she was not conceived in Egypt. Rashi says, uh, so, you know, you see, look at this, look at this verse and you say, how can you get a masterpiece sermon out of this, right? Like what's, what's going on here? Rabbi Ben Min spoke brilliantly about the concept of a woman who was born between the walls. And he understood that to mean somebody who lived uh, like Rachav, the Sham Yoshevet, and there she lived. That that she lived between the walls. The person who lives between the walls, who is born between the walls, is somebody who lives on the margins of society. They don't live in either in either community. They're they're kind of a bridge. That she was born between the walls. In this context, I want to read to you something very powerful. I might be off screen, but I'm going to read this to people. People might not have heard this story, but I have a feeling you're going to hear about it in the future. There was a tremendous tragedy in Israel today, and one of the names of the soldiers who was published as having fallen, was name was Uri Yah Beyer from Ma'alot. Did you hear about him? Let me tell you. Uri Yah, he's one of these people who live between the walls. He was 20, and he was serving in Maglan. Maglan is one of the most prestigious commandos. He was severely injured a few days ago, and he and he died yesterday. Uriah was not Israeli. He was not even Jewish. He was Christian and German. He grew up in Malot, and he decided to volunteer for the commandos, and he and he went into the this incredibly difficult task. His grandparents were Hans and Crystal Bayer. They came to Israel in the sixties to join the staff of a nursing home founded by German evangelists in the Galilee. This nursing home, Beit Eliezer, is dedicated to care for Holocaust survivors and is entirely financed by private people, not the government. The home is run by German people, whose vol all volunteers, whose motto is, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. They interpret this verse as a commandment made to them to comfort the people of Israel from the suffering of the Holocaust. And they are not Jewish, but they that they hold a kosher kitchen and they, they're Shomer Shabbat. So they these children all went to school in Malot, their children, and their Uriah's brother was a finalist in the National Bible Contest. And so anyway, then it talks about how everybody, when the news of his injury spread, all the people in Malot gathered to recite Psalms. And yesterday, uh, the the they when they announced his death, they mentioned Jesus. Um, but but that was 
that was what this person was about. And there was another person who died, I saw also, who was a Messianic Jew. So there have been multiple people who died who believe who's, whose divinity is Jesus. And this person is just one of these people, I think, can you imagine, he was living between the walls. That's what I thought of this mm -hmm. Rashi. He was part of multiple societies. Uh, that phrase, comfort me, my people. Is that from Isaiah? It's from Isaiah. And they took it upon themselves to be a comfort to the Jewish people. And he, he, these are the types of stories you just... That's the same oratorio in the, in the side. Uh, Malot was also yeah. one of the first places that was attacked by the PLO. Yeah, well, we know Malot is the in, famous in the place where... Yeah, uh, I think in the early 70s where many children were massacred. 20, 22 kids were killed. Yeah, went to school kids, right? They were killed. They were yeah, Jewish. Of course. of course, of course, terrible tragedy. And okay, so we go on. So okay, B'nai God, Tzifion, the Chagi Shuni Vetzbon, the children of God were Tzifion, Chagi Shuni, and Etzbon, Eri, Arodi, and Areli. The the children of Asher were Yimna, Yishva, Yishvi, Bria, Serach, Achotam. And Serach, their sister, Ubine, Bria, Hever, O Malkiel. Again, we're wondering why is Serach named here? Usually they all mention the girls unless it's important. Ela, Bene, Zilpa, verse 18. These are the children of Zilpa, Asher, Nasan, Lavan, Lulea, Bito, that Lavan gave to Leah, his daughter. Vatelet, at Ela, Leakov, Sheshes, Reinafesh. And these children were born to Jacob, 16 souls. Bene, Rachel, the children of Rachel, Eshet, Yaakov, the wife of Jacob. Were whom were Yosef and Benjamin? And Rashi points out that she's the only one called the wife of Jacob. She's the only one called the wife of Jacob. She was the mainstay of the house. She was the she was the wife. And there was born to Joseph. To Joseph were born in the land of Egypt, Asher Yaldalo, Asnat Bat Potifera, Kohen On, Osnat, the daughter of Potifera, the priest of On, was Menashe and Ephraim. Ubene Binyamin, the children of Binyamin were Bela, Becher, Ashbel, Gera, Naman, Echi, Rosh, Mupim, Chupim, and Ar, ten sons. We I mentioned this in uh, Rash, mentioned this on Shabbos morning that Rashi quoted them. All these names refer back to. The, to Joseph in some level. Oh, Mr. Dobson. Oh, Mr. Dobson. Ela b'nei Rachel, asher yuad Yaakov. These were the children of Rachel who were born to Jacob. Kol nefesh or basar. All the souls were 14. Ubenei Naphtali and the children of Naphtali were Yachzael, Guni, Yitzer, Veshile. Oh, this is these are names we have to get right when we read the Torah. Okay, Benjamin. And we'll just do two more verses, then we'll stop and daven. Ewa b'nei Bilah. These are the children of Bilah. Asher Natan, Lavan, Rachel Bito, that Lavan gave to Rachel, his daughter. Vatelot, and Elo Yaakov. And these were born to Jacob, Kol Nefesh Shiva. All the souls were seven. So Rachel... Caesar, the sons of Dua, she had only seven sons. Kohen Nefesh Abal Yaakov, Nitraima, Yotse, Yerecho, Aha, Mavan Neshe, Bene Yaakov, Kohen Nefesh, Shishim Vesheish. All right, what's, we'll do this Pasuk 26 tomorrow. We'll stop here so we can dive in Mincha at this time. Let's stop to dive in Mincha. Okay, Yashikoch to everybody. 